This is a wonderful moment to be talking about commercial real estate, residential real estate, infrastructure spending at a time when Treasury yields just hit a new post-2007 high. We're looking at mortgage rates that are the highest levels going back to uh, 2001. Chris, from your vantage point last week, we were talking to a commercial real estate CEO who said that he thinks we're seeing the bottom of office uh, space prices. Do you agree? <laughs> Lisa, it's, it's great, uh, great to be here. You know, that's a that's a tough one, um, you know, and again, for us and for our business, for two decades, we focused on alternative real estate. So we've tended to stay away from the traditional sectors. And I think, you know, with the office market, uh, there's certainly going to be the have and, and the have nots in, in that sector. But there is a lot of uncertainty. And I think that uncertainty has been fueling the demand and the alternative segments where we where we have and others have focused around education, healthcare, student housing, senior housing, medical where demand is consistent. And so that's again, where we're seeing increased demand from investors from around the globe, given this uncertainty in a lot of the traditional real estate sectors. Well, before we get to some of those opportunities, I am curious from your vantage point, whether there are actual markets in some of the more stressed areas. We talk about residential real estate and how the transaction volumes has fallen off a cliff, at least of existing homes. Yeah. Same with uh, certain areas of the more stressed commercial real estate. Is this a broken market that we're looking at when we look at some of these sectors? I don't necessarily know if it's broken. I mean, if this is sort of the second black swan event we've been through. We've been through the GFC. We saw a lot of challenges in traditional real estate. Traditional real estate is very much tied to what's going on in the overall economy. And again, that uncertainty creates a lot of discomfort as to where, where price discovery is, where your basis is. And again, I think that's fueling this interest and continued demand in the alternative segments where demand is consistent throughout cycles. When you talk about some of the alternative areas, I wonder about some of the income drivers there, given the fact that people are finding, you know, cash T-bills, uh, giving them 5% and liking that. What kind of returns are you looking for? What kind of income are you looking for in some of the uh, real estate properties that you're going after? You know, it, it really depends. I mean, the, you know, it, it, the, the cost of capital spans. It, it can be core investing to opportunistic investing. I think for investors that we're talking with, and I'm spending a lot of time in Asia, Europe, the Middle East, these investors are sort of looking at the at the long-term play and assets that can reprice in an inflationary environment, assets that are resilient. Um, it's really people thinking about where do they want to place capital over the next 5, 10, 15 years where you're going to see consistent demand. And the beauty of these alternative sectors is we can get stronger income returns than traditional real estate without the volatility. And so it's that risk is just a return that I think is driving so many interested parties into these asset classes. So are you looking at senior homes because we're all getting older and student housing because we're all paying way too much for college, just saying personally? Well, it's interesting. I mean, you take those pieces. I mean, enrollments are up at universities. And again, you've got to focus on the right universities. We focus on the power five universities. Enrollments are up. Supply is 50% of what it was at its peak levels. You think of senior housing. You've got 4 million people hitting the age of 80 by the end of this decade, and we're delivering 20 to 30% of the housing for that. So again, we continue to age. We continue to want to get educated. We're going to wake up in three to five years and wonder where is that supply. So right now, that is why this is some of the best vintage year opportunities to invest in these asset classes because demand is consistent and it's just difficult to finance projects. So supply is, is way off. You mentioned that you were traveling overseas, in particular in Asia, uh, once a, a very uh, fertile place for money going into the U.S. real estate market. Are there still as many interested investors in Asia looking to invest in U.S. real estate, albeit not perhaps commercial real estate tied to offices, but the kind of non-traditional assets you're talking about? I mean, we're, we're seeing it and, you know, we're so fortunate. You know, we opened an office in Tokyo. We now have an office in Seoul. So we're seeing a lot of demand from Asian investors wanting to invest in, in U.S. real estate, more particularly in these alternative asset classes that have really become institutionalized. So when you think of student, senior, medical office, life science, self-storage, data centers, those asset classes, we're seeing increased demand. I mean, it's 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 a busy calendar for me going over and meeting with all these groups, looking at how do you access these asset classes? Because th that is the challenge. The fundamentals are there. We've seen the resilience through many cycles now. 
but it is very hard to access these asset classes. They're very fragmented. So I think a lot of investors see the benefits, but are wondering how do we actually get exposure to these asset classes? What are they taking money away from to put it into some of what you're talking about? Well, I think you know, you're seeing the allocations to real assets increase. I mean, a lot of the investors that we're talking to are starting to increase their allocations to real assets. So they're going from five, seven percent to potentially 10, 12, 15 percent. So I think they're taking it from other asset classes, potentially equities where there's more volatility. So I think it's that safety, that resilience. So we've seen a lot of folks, again, increasing those allocations to real assets, wondering where do I want to be for the next decade? And so again, that's driving, I think, this interest in the alternative space. So you're targeting 10 to 15% returns that typically the type of investor and the type of returns that they're expecting? It depends. I mean, it, you know, some products could be 10 to 15%, some could be lower. What we try and do is have flexible capital. Um, for those investors that are looking for lower leverage, longer term income returns, we're very competitive with long term fixed rate investments. For investors that are looking for opportunistic, where we can go into a market and develop and create assets, we're very consistent and, and, and we think we can deliver great risk adjusted returns against private equity and other real estate strategies. But every strategy, whether it's our U.S. investments, our Canadian investments, our European investments, yeah. has a different risk return profile.